that quickly. So this oh, is Jonathan sure. Williams, faculty <laughs> here at IFA. Uh, he's going to explain the meaning. Of, uh, my undergrad was uh, in philosophy, so it makes me really happy. Uh, oh, that Jonathan's okay. going to explain the meaning of life. <laughs> so please. Don't well, please. short answer: I don't have all the answers. Um, <laughs> no. no. But I'm going to give you an astronomical perspective on a sort of a, uh, ancient old age yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to um, interrupt me if you have any questions along the way. Um, sure. If they're deep questions, we can Fair move it to the end. Um, but basically, it's just a fun journey through the universe. Um, it won't be too mathematical. Uh, this is really for some people may know the answer is, the meaning, is 42. That's a reference to an old sci fi book uh, called uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> The old people my age will know that. I, I was a kid when this came out. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a really good book for the young ones. The young ones are probably more familiar with chat GPT. So I asked them, what is the meaning of life? And this was the answer I got. Uh, you will get different answers, of course. Chat GPT is different for everyone. Um, but you know, it's, it's a, basically, it is, it's, a, it's a philosophical existential question that's been debated for centuries. Okay, and I'm gonna give you uh, the astronomical perspective what does astronomy tell us about us? Okay, so we'll start off here. Here we are on this blue planet orbiting the sun. The sun is just a regular star. We'll get to that in just a minute, but, but here we are. So, um, and it's just a little planet. If you go to the nearest neighbor, which is the moon, okay, that's what it looks like. We're just getting smaller and smaller. If you were to go to another planet, Right, there's eight planets, eight big planets in our solar system. You all know this is Saturn, right? So this was taken by a spacecraft that went into orbit around Saturn. And because it was in orbit, it could look back towards the inner part of the solar system. And it could see, uh, that, in fact, the sun is right behind Saturn right now. So the, the spacecraft is here, Saturn's in the way of blocking the sun like an eclipse. And that's why this, the rings look really bright. But if you also look, when you look back towards the inner solar system, you'll see the Earth. So can you see the Earth here? <laughs> Let me jog, you see if you can see it now. Oh my, what, where? Okay, can you see it now, right? So there it is. And if we zoom in, that's what it looks like. That's us. That's all 8 billion of us, right? 8 billion people oh my on that thing. And then this is kind of weird, right? What's, what, you know what that is? The that's the moon, right? Yeah. So, so that's what it looks like. Basically, it's like a pixel on the camera from Cassini. Right? Um, and we're just going around the sun, and there's lots and lots of suns and stars out there. Uh, in fact, if you were to go, you know, as you walked in here, you probably saw that scale model of the solar system, right? So if you made our sun the size of a grapefruit, uh, the, I have to look it up. I oh, I, I don't have my notes here. I, I can't remember. Oh, yes, right. If, if our sun is the size of a grapefruit, do you know where the next sun would be? Do you want to guess? Anne, you should know this. <laughs> Anne is a professor emeritus here. She's been here 50 years. <laughs> um, so if the sun was the size of a grapefruit, the next grapefruit, the next star would be in San Francisco. So you can think about that next time you fly to the mainland, right? So all these uh, of stars, like our sun, right? So we went to Saturn and the Earth was a little dark. Now we're gonna go to other stars. It's like changing that star to the size of the grapefruit and flying to San Francisco. How many stars are there in the galaxy? Does anyone know? Yes. It's infinity? Not infinity, but it's pretty big. <laughs> it's, it's effectively infinity. It's hard. It's a number that's so big it's hard to imagine. There's about 250 billion stars, like our sun, in the in the Milky Way. Okay, and then what is the Milky Way? The Milky Way is a galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy, and it's made of stars. And the stars, there's so many stars, they just kind of merge into one. But every little dot here, it's it's, a, it's called Milky Way. It's just basically a patch. It's, this is like is the stars are so numerous, they become like a uniform brightness. Um, but there are about 250 billion stars in this galaxy. This is a galaxy like the Milky Way. It's not our Milky Way because we're stuck inside it. You can't get a picture like this when you're stuck inside. But this is a galaxy nearby that looks like our Milky Way. And let's go further out. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, um, how do you get a picture like that? 
Yeah. So that's that's taken from a telescope. That was actually the Hubble Space Telescope took that picture. So you need to go outside. No, you can take it from Monica. You can take it from your backyard with a with a good telescope and oh, a good I camera. See. So it's just another galaxy. So here's another picture of a bunch of galaxies. Every uh, so here's you can kind of see right there's kind of a spiral there. Um, but every dot here, this, these are not stars anymore, these are galaxies. Every dot here is a galaxy, and there's a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. Can you show a yeah. picture of, of the Milky Way? You say this is the Milky Way, and you say you are here, we are here on this planet, arms. You know? How do, what, is that just a picture of another galaxy showing you what? what That's right, That's, or it's an artist impression. Yeah, yeah. But, but when we're inside it, there are ways to figure out where you are. You can't get a good picture, you can't. So it's like standing on the earth, you kind of know where you are in Hawaii. So you don't get a big map of what, because you're not high enough up to look down, right? So there's 100 billion galaxies. Each galaxy has, we have a, we're in a big galaxy with 250 billion. Most galaxies have maybe closer to 100 billion. So 100 billion galaxies times 100 billion stars makes one with 22 zeros. There's no, there's no name. We don't have a name for that larger number. Um, what we do is we have notation for it. So there's 22 zeros after that, so we say 10 to the 22. That's called scientific notation. It's a uh, technical word. It's an astronomically large number. What's the margin of error for that? <laughs> Within a factor of a few. Maybe a factor of 10. Order of magnitude. Who, who said that? Okay. Ah, yeah. Order of magnitude. So, <laughs> all right. How do we make sense of that? That, you've probably heard this before. There's more stars in the, in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. Not just the beach that you go down to uh, in Hawaii or all the beaches on Hawaii. You have to go to all the beaches in every place on Earth, count all those sand particles, and you still haven't counted all the stars in the galaxy. <laughs> in the universe, so. Yeah. Does it include the sand in the water? Uh, good question. That's a good question. Uh, and I, uh, that's a good question. No one's ever asked me that. It says uh, all the beaches. It says beaches. That's right. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. Mm. Um, I suspect that if you were to take all the sand not on the beaches but underwater, you might maybe double or triple, maybe make it five times larger. And so when I, when I was answering that question, I said order of magnitude. In astronomy, we're very loose with numbers because the numbers are so big. If we're within two or three times the number, we're happy. So I would say all the sand in the, in the, world, in, in, in the world would be about roughly equal to about all the stars in the universe. And we do know now from a lot of work uh, done here and elsewhere that the average number of planets per star is at least one probably more than one. So for every star, there's a planet. And some stars don't have planets, but many stars have more than one planet and the average is greater than one. So this applies not just to stars, but planets. There are as many planets as there is sand on all the beaches and possibly under the water too in the universe. Okay. Okay, that's a very, very quick tour. Um, you basically, the point is these large numbers are, hard to comprehend. It's hard to make sense of it. Um, the universe is extremely large. Not infinite, but it's very, very, very big. So that's the size and the numbers. What about the time? It's about this, it's true for the time. We're older than we can imagine. Okay, so let me actually try to make you imagine this. All right, so here's a very famous painting. Um, may not be able to show this in certain states in the US anymore, but... Um, <laughs> So if you go, this is from the Sistine Chapel, right? Leonardo da Vinci uh, drew it. Does anyone know the name of this? Jesus? Sistine. It's the Sistine Chapel name of the painting. Painting? Yes. God giving life to Adam. Yes, right. So let's go out with Adam and his breath touch. Okay, so why am I showing that? Well, I show, the painting is about 500 years old. The sun is 4.4567. Thousand thousand. That's four five six seven million, or four point five six seven billion years old. Okay, and these numbers we know it to that precision. Right? We don't know the numbers over here. We say put zeros there. We do know it to four significant figures, which is astonishing when you think about it. And that's another whole other story. Actually, it's mostly figured out by people down on campus, not in astronomy so much. It's people who look at meteorites. 
um, the universe is let's see, thousands, million, billion, so 13.7 billion years old. Okay, so about three times uh, older than the sun. Okay, how do we make sense of that? Let's zoom in here and suppose our arm, so you might stick your arm out if you want and think about this as the age of the where this is zero and this is the age, this is the current day. That's about a one meter. And I'll just use metric here because it's much easier. <laughs> so let's think about um, billions of years. If we made um, a billion years um, uh, equal to a meter, let me get this right. Um, no, actually, let's say, okay. Let's think about human lifetime, human existence. We've been around for about a few thousand years of, of sort of recorded history. A few thousand years compared to a few billion years is a f one in about a million, roughly, right? One in about a million. Because um, a thousand million is a billion. So if human history is a few thousand years and the universe is a few billion years, then human history is about one million of the lifetime of the universe. What is one million? What is one millionth of a meter? Do you know what a millionth of a meter is? It's a micron. So a centimeter is one one hundredth. Um, a millimeter is one one thousandth. A micron is one um, micron. One micron compared to, to this. Do you know, can we think of a micron? Um, so do you know how thick your hair is? All right, next time you comb your hair, think about it, it's 10 microns thick. And I want to talk about human history being one micron compared to my arm. So here, um, <clears throat> I don't have an, actually I do have, a, I was looking for a nail file. I don't have a nail file, but uh, I have a nail clipper, but it has a nail file. If I were to take my, this is life, this is a life of the universe. So zero here, I can just erase recorded human history. So. I've erased <laughs> history, right? That's how, how tiny uh, our, ex our lifetime has been uh, in the universe. There's another way to do this. You can um, go to Wikipedia. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the sun is, let's say, 5 billion. 4.567 billion years, yeah. On average, how long does it live? We're about halfway through our lifetime. So it will actually live for about roughly 10, 10 billion years. Yeah, so um, the, uh, there's lots of this, you know, I'm not saying anything that's sort of new or anything that's, in fact, lots of great websites. This is just from Wikipedia, where you can look, just Google Cosmic Calendar. And we start off with the Big Bang. I'll get to that in just a little bit. We form galaxies. We showed these pictures of galaxies. Um, and the sun came along at some point, um, like, uh, um, Right, so this is January. The sun came along only in September, two thirds of the way through the year, because the universe is about 15 billion years old. The sun is roughly 5 billion years old. So it's two thirds after the sun, so September. And then we get to October, November, December, and then we just get to December. You can compress December. Now you've got um, geology and dinosaurs and hominids and so on and so forth. And you keep going and there's migrations of people. And now there's civilizations. And then you keep going, and now we're into December. Uh, this is December 31st, right here at the bottom. And you keep going, and you go through, and, and we really only start appearing with recorded history about 10 seconds to midnight on the cosmic calendar. And what's really kind of disturbing on this scale is that the average lifetime on this human scale, on this sort of, um, if we compress the, the age of the universe into one year, we only live for the blink of an eye, 0.23 seconds. Yeah. So that's pretty impressive. <laughs> so, okay, so I've tried to kind of show you the scale of things and it can be kind of like really, like I, the, you know, there's just, the universe is so big and it's so vast and it goes on <clears> for so long, right? What, what is the point of our existence in this vast universe? Okay, so, um, and you know, there's many, many, um, Philosophers who thought about that, it can make you depressed. If you think about it too much, it can make you think this is meaningless, right? Or it can make you like, well, we're here to figure out this all this scale. And isn't it, I love this picture because it's like, you know, we're here on Earth, but we have uniquely among all the 
living beings and um, living animals on, on earth, we thought this ability to be conscious and be, to, to have this consciousness of the universe um, and to look out, if you like, to break through that sky and look out to see that what's working. How is this universe working? Um, and so now let me talk a little bit about some astronomy stuff. And, and, and as you keep pondering these mysteries, we find even more mysteries. And that's part of the excitement to me of doing astronomy is that we just keep, the more questions you ask, the more questions you find. And you just learn more and more and it gets, uh, it's just an exciting adventure. One thing we found is the universe is finely tuned. And what do I mean by that? So you saw this picture at the top of the cosmic calendar. There was a big bang, a massive explosion. There's a place called the cosmic microwave background. And what goes through all these things, maybe some of you have heard that. We formed the first stars. You're gonna hear about the first stars, the JWST. I think in the next few years, they're gonna detect the very first stars in the universe. Um, then you form galaxies, we keep going. So this is time, this is space on this axis, this is time on this axis. And the universe expanded very, very uh, quickly. It's called a period of inflation, and it, but it continues to expand, but not so quickly now. Um, if it expanded too fast, then um, the universe would rip apart. If it expanded too slowly, gravity would pull it together. And the analogy here is, okay, if I had a ball or a laser pointer, if I throw it up, it comes back down, that's gravity. Okay, so I just throw it up with a low speed, it comes back down. If I throw it with a really high speed, it'd go through the ceiling, right? But if I throw it really, really fast, it would go up and it would never come down. It would just keep going up and up. It would escape Earth's gravity, right? If you give it more energy than Earth can hold on to, it keeps going. So there is what's called the big rip. If the energy of the expansion was too much, the universe would have ripped apart. If it was too small, gravity would have pulled it back together. So all the big crunch. But it's not. We've, we've lasted for 13.7 billion years. And we are in this phase right here where we're kind of, it's like I threw it up and it's not coming down. It's, it's, not, it's not escaping, but it's also not falling. It's just in this sort of perfect balance. And that's really hard to do. So you can write equations. And there are two parameters, we've got omega naught and lambda. There won't be a test afterwards, but they are two parameters. <laughs> and omega naught tells us how, how fast you kind of had to throw that up. And we, we would say if omega naught is one, if it's greater than one, it means it comes, it comes back down. Gravity, gravity is strong. If it's less than one, it goes up and goes on forever. It escapes. But omega naught is one, as far as we can tell, and we can tell pretty well. We can tell it's within one part in this many. And how many zeros is that? I'll save you from counting. It's 57 zeros. So one part in 10 to the 57. The universe is what that's called what we call flat. And it, why we call it flat or not is because it refers to space-time geometry. Um, and if you go down downstairs, there's a black hole, it shows how gravity distorts space. That's so, so the fact that, flat, that it's flat means that the gravity is effectively, the space is effectively flat, okay? So when you go downstairs, take a look at that black hole demonstration. Um, cosmological constant is even harder to explain, but it refers to um, dark energy. Um, and what's going on here is that even in a vacuum, whether you think there's nothing, there are virtual particles that come in and out of existence because, um, some people may have heard about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, things like that. There are um, fluctuations that can happen, and there can be, even in a vacuum, there can be a particle and an antiparticle can just come out in and out of existence. Because they mirror each other, it keeps, the, it keeps things, effectively, the average is zero, but there are things there as a positive and a negative. Um, this uh, produces, so even though there's nothing there in a the vacuum, there are what we call virtual particles that creates a virtual pressure. And again, that should expand things. This is what we call energy, dark energy. And it's this perverse thing. We, we actually don't know much about it. We don't, we don't know how to explain it, but it's like I threw a ball up and, and it would come back down because of gravity, right? So I throw it up. Even if I threw it up so it could escape the earth, it would slow down because gravity would pull it back together. But in the universe, in the, uh, in the expansion of the universe, it actually, you throw it up and it goes faster and faster and faster and faster. It's like anti-gravity. It is really weird. And um, it's, it's almost zero, it's almost none of this, but it's not zero. And if it was zero, 
then the universe wouldn't be the way it is. It's so close to zero, it's actually 10 to minus 122, 122 zeros after zero. That's, a, that's much, much smaller than a Google. Uh, Google is 10 to the 100, right? That's why it's called Google, right? Because um, the, the, the internet was meant to be infinite. Okay, so I know it's hard to explain this, but let me just, just I wanted to point out just how we know these numbers to incredible precision, and they are very close to zero, but not zero. They're very close to one, but not one. Um, How do you measure it? Uh, we measure it because we look at the look at this curve in the background. So we can effectively look at the scale of the universe as a function of time. So we can look back in time, right? That's the beauty of telescopes. So you can look at high redshift objects. Who asked that question? I can't remember who asked it, but anyway, um, okay, right. So we can look at high redshift objects, look back in time, we can look at the scale of the universe. So we effectively can plot points along this curve. And so we find that we're not on this curve and on that curve, we're on this curve. And you extrapolating from, from the point that you know, from the point that you know, know of, um, based on based on what you well, see. Well, we, we, we look at galaxies at different times. And actually, also look back at the, um, the cosmic microwave background, which comes back from about a thousand years. So it's a, it is. Uh, a lot of delicate observations, a lot of detailed observations. Um, so this is what we mean by fine tuning. It's like there are, the universe is, is just sort of particularly set up, incredibly finely tuned to not be ripping apart and not be collapsing. It's just perfectly balanced. Um, if we look at our sun, there's nuclear reactions going on in our sun. It converts hydrogen into helium that creates energy. In bigger stars, hydrogen converts to helium and then helium goes on and it ends up con um, converting into carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. These are critical elements for life. These reactions that you make that, that go from oxygen to nitrogen to carbon and so on, these are nuclear reactions and there are reaction rates, just like there are chemical reaction rates, there are nuclear reaction rates. And we can go ahead and talk to nuclear physicists um, and they will measure these reaction rates and they will, make, they will figure out how nuclear synthesis occurs in the sun. But if those reaction rates were just a tiny bit different, the amount of elements you'd get would be totally different. And in particular, carbon is very finely balanced where if, if the reaction rate for carbon was just a little bit different, there would either be no carbon in the universe or there'd be, or all stars would be turning to carbon or something like that. So, so it's very, again, very finely balanced. And I won't get into all the details here, but um, it's, uh, there are, the, the scale of the universe is such that there are balances in the scale and the scale of, the of nuclear physics is such that it just is perfectly balanced to create the elements that make us up. Um, another fine, fine tuning is the solar system is um, Earth in particular is finely balanced. Solar system is balanced in the sense of having something like Jupiter to stop comets from hitting us. Comets uh, kill the dinosaurs, but we don't get too many comets. We get enough stability for life to evolve. We have water, we're at the right temperature. We have a stable orbit. We have a moon that stops our axis from flipping. There's lots and lots of things where if you look at it, you're like, wow, that's kind of amazing that we have that. And if we didn't have it, the Earth would not be a habitable place. There's so, but there's lots and lots of planets, so maybe that's not quite fine tuning so much as luck. Um, but this sort of fine tuning versus luck is what is what we call the anthropic principle. So one of the answers to why is the universe the way it is, is because it's the way it is because we're here to look at it. If if it wasn't the way it is, humans wouldn't exist, and so you wouldn't ask the question, right? So. That's your philosophy question, Ted. <laughs> so, so this is not really, it's more of a philosophical question. We, you know, it's like, does a tree, if you don't see a tree fall, right? Does, it, does, it, does a tree fall in the forest? What's that classic philosophy question? Does the ice box light on when you close the door? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So do, is the universe the way it is simply because we're here to see it? And if the universe was different, then you wouldn't have humans, and so you wouldn't ask the question. So it's not really a, it's a philosophical answer rather than a scientific answer, because science makes predictions. Um, the only prediction you get from this is that there must be multiverses. So here's a universe, here's another universe, here's another universe. And maybe they interact, maybe they don't. Um, but, but what does it mean to be a universe, a multi-universe, right? Universe, by definition, is everything. So it gets very hairy very quickly. I'm not an expert in this. Yeah. Isn't that a rather conceited um, viewpoint from, from the human aspect? I mean, 
It's saying <clears throat> the universe is the way it is because we exist. It's sort of like, therefore, I think I am. It is a little bit like that, but I mean, it, could, it does say, it, it says, we're in this universe because the conditions are right to produce life. But there may be other universes where the conditions are not right to produce life, and it could just be a whole universe with a whole different set of physics. Right, but and no different, different kinds of right. life. So, so it's not necessarily conceded in the sense <clears throat> that we're in this universe, but there are lots of other universes. Right? So it's called the multi-universe theory. And it doesn't say that, you, so it's not, there was, it used to be, we thought the earth was the center of the universe. <laughs> then we thought the sun was the center of the galaxy. We thought the galaxy was the center of the universe, all these things. And we finally realized we're not any of those things. Um, and now maybe this is saying there's many universes and we're not the only universe, right? So it's probably just an evolution of that idea. But this is much more speculative, right? In the sense that we know the earth is not the center of the universe, but we don't know how many universes there are. Or what is it? just one, and we can't see past a certain point. Well, we, we can only see a certain part yeah. of the universe, but the physics is all the same. As far as we can tell, the physics is the same. The carbon, the nuclear synthesis oh, rates are the yeah. same. If it's a multi, right. everything so would the be physics different. Would be different yeah. here, right? The physics would be different here, but maybe here is just right. Mm -hmm. okay. But we'd have to have it because of the fine tuning. The fine tuning is so perfect. Right, so yeah, it's just a tiny bit. There would be a whole froth. A we would die in one of the yeah. So again, go to the beach, yeah. watch the waves crash. Every <clears throat> bubble could be a universe. Who knows? And if they put us in one of those other ones, we wouldn't survive because that's right. You wouldn't. You would have no. Yeah. You may not have stars. You may not have planets. Anyway. They may be a different form of life, but not us. Yeah. We, yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> so, what is the resolution to this? If the universe is made for us, then what? So let's get back to this question. What is the meaning of life, right? So whether you subscribe to the idea of multi-universes or the anthropic principle, the way the thing is, the universe does appear to be just right. Now, that may just be a coincidence. It may be a bigger meaning. You can fill in the blanks there. But what is our destiny as humans in this sort of lucky universe, right? So. I talked about the size of the universe, size of the galaxy. Is it that we should get off the Earth and explore this universe, right? That's sort of a human trait, right? We figure out that we, uh, we've we got, there's, there's, there's a big unexplored land. We're like, let's go colonize it, right? I'm from England, so I know about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but there's a Fermi paradox. Some of you have probably heard of the Fermi paradox, a very famous paradox. And the Fermi paradox was, this was being debated at some science meeting and Fermi, Enrico Fermi, who, who was a big name in, in uh, physics, he did a lot of work on nuclear fusion and so on. Um, he said, well, if that's true, where are the aliens, right? Because um, just imagine, right? As soon as you start building, as soon as you can build ships and you can go from your piece of land to someone else's piece of land, then pretty soon you can colonize that and you can build more ships and go to the next one. And, and you know, you colonize the entire world very quickly. Um, and remember, remember, right? Here's the universe, Big Bang here, we're here. We had a thousand years is a micron, right? One tenth the size of a hair, I could file it off. So we're here, but if any civilization was back here and they were able to do this, then they would have colonized the world, or colonized the, the universe, right? So um, if, if, you know, if we wanted to colonize space and we could get, the, could get to do that, then we should colonize the universe pretty quickly. And so the question, but we've only just arrived. So why hasn't someone else done that? So that's kind of the Fermi paradox. Where are the aliens, right? Why aren't they here? And the answer to that, there's only three answers to that. There's basically that we really are alone in the universe. There's no one else. We're the first, even though we're this tiny blip at the end of this arm, right? We are the first. That's one answer. Second answer is it's really hard. And, you know, you're on an island and maybe it's just really, really hard to travel to another island, right? Um, you know, that's the analogy. That would be saying it's really hard for us to go from this grapefruit-sized sun to another grapefruit-sized sun in San Francisco using our technology. And they say, well, you know, technology will improve, but maybe technology, technology always has pros and cons. 
And maybe you start building nuclear spacecraft. To, that's what you need to get to the other stars. And maybe you blow yourself up or whatever, right? So it, <clears throat> there may be technological reasons. It's just, it's just really, really hard to do. Or civilizations that can get to the point where they can do this destroy themselves in other ways. We'll do something like that. That's the sad answer. I, this, this is the sort of like, that's the kind of, that's something you have to think about when you maybe had too much to drink. This is something that's pretty <laughs> sad. And then, um, but this is the sort of like uh, the stuff of sci-fi. There's other answers. Oh, I spelled that wrong. It should be S-Y-F-I, sci-fi. Um, here's another cultural reference. Hang on just a second. So who's seen 2001? Probably all the old people, right? This is 2001. <laughs> and 2010. And 2010. So <clears throat> I actually got my kids. I, I tried to go back and made them watch it. And I have to say it was not as good as I remember. But anyway, it's, it's by today's standards, it's kind of slow. But anyway, um, um, in 2000 Space Odyssey, the idea was that we there's a galactic uber civilization that's watching over us. And they're waiting for this for us to kind of grow, to, to reach a level of galactic maturity, civilization, you know, maturity, where we can um, join the rest of, of the, yeah, of the universe. Of right. Yeah, so maybe that's another answer. Sorry, you had a question? No, actually, that was my... The third, yeah. The third, third. Because, I mean, yeah. probably we're not interesting. Yeah. Maybe we're not interested, right. They're we're just they a little... Because they weren't impressed. Right. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> so... <laughs> but let's let's bring it home a little bit because time is running out. And I, I um, but uh, so that's kind of a tour of the universe. Bottom line is, in our lifetimes, we're not going anywhere. Um, this is home. Uh, probably always will be. I don't know if we'll, you know, I'm not. I you know, Elon Musk is doing good things in some cases, <laughs> crazy things in other ways. But you know, he wants to go to Mars um, and has a great ambition. I don't think we're going to produce a civilization on Mars. Another generation. certainly not in my lifetime, not in my kids' lifetime, probably not in their kids' lifetime. Um, we have to look after this plan. I mean, you know, there is great sci-fi on Mars, but this let's let's sort of get back down to Earth and let's bring it back. All that kind of amazing stuff about multiverses. Go back down and think back to what you know. What is our, what, what do we, you know, what is our role? What is our d destiny as a sort of, a, in this big universe? If we, either if we're alone or, or, you know, or it's just too hard to go elsewhere, or we're waiting for someone to say we're ready, well, what can we do, right? And if you think back to this thousand years, a few thousand years of human history, what are the names you know, right? What are the things that happen? There's, there's, um, there's, there's a, a kind of literature, then art, have legacies, right? If you go and visit all the museums, you see these amazing things that happen. There's human rights and dignity that has, has grown. You know, we, we, we have matured in many ways um, as a civilization, become a global, global kind of global human rights. We have the UN and so on and so forth. It's not perfect, but we're getting there. What are the other names you remember? They're names like this, right? Aristotle, Galileo, Newton, Einstein. Scientists, right? Science produced legacies. Um, and you know, and we also expand human boundaries. All of these, as all of these things, the, the, the art, the literature, the politics, the adventurers, and the scientists expand human boundaries. Those are our legacies. Great civilizations expand human boundaries in different ways, right? And I think America um, will be known for many things, um, obviously. Um, but one of the crowning science achievements it was the first nation to land on the Earth, on, on the Moon, right? So. Um, we expand our boundaries. Um, okay, let's think about what happens in Hawaii, right? We are, uh, you know, I'm a professor here. We have this amazing set of facilities on Mauna Kea. We understand we, there was a meeting on TMT just before this. Um, it's a very controversial place. It's a very, there's a lot of debate about how we handle this. But I, all I will say is that discoveries made here are really at the forefront of human knowledge. We are pushing the knowledge of humans ahead here, right here in Hawaii. Um, and I hope we can continue to do that. Um, there was a, one of my favorite quotes about why do you do this stuff? Why do you build things to do this? You don't, you know, you don't, why do you do pure research? Why, why do we care about astronomy and studying the multiverses and the nuclear reaction rates and so on? Well, it's nothing to do, you know, there was a, there was a um, director of Fermi lab in Chicago. They built this big accelerator to fire 
uh, particles around and around in magnets to watch them collide with each other, to learn about the inner parts of the atom. And he had to defend himself in a congressional hearing and a congressman who, of course, we don't even remember anymore, because he's a congressman, um, <laughs> he said, why, why should I, how does building this particle accelerator help defend, help make the US stronger? How does it defend, how does it make, you know, how does it contribute to the US defense? He said, it does have nothing to do with defending our country, but it makes it worth defending, right? So that's my favorite quote of um, why we do abstract science. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, um, well, I don't make these big discoveries. <laughs> I, I've published a few papers. I make a few small discoveries. I'm sort of known a little bit in my group of thousand people who do my field, probably. That's about it. Um, but, you know, I teach <laughs> students. Um, I love to see my PhD students move on, become professors elsewhere, and, and pass on that knowledge. I have a lot of fun at Mauna Kea in Chile. And, this is a Subaru telescope. It's a lot of fun. It's a great job. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm lucky to raise a family here um, and fish and throw the dog on the beach. And this is what ChatGPT says at the end of that whole thing, right? And ultimately, you have to find your own meeting. And it's, you know, you can strengthen your, your relationships, careers, personal growth, spirituality, contribution to society. So I don't have an answer. Maybe ChatGPT does. Um, but I'll summarize uh, one final thing from chat GTP. Is astronomy worthwhile? Yes, absolutely. So thank you for your attention. I'll probably take one or two questions. Well, I got a... Have we ever had any well, life form or biologically anything ever survived coming in from outer space? Bacteria or anything? There, like was, there was, no. No, nothing. So, so occasionally you might see a claim in something, but there's, there has, there's been one interstellar object. The next speaker, Karen up there, will tell us about a, an object from outer space that came into our solar system and then left because things move very quickly. Um, but so we didn't land on it. There are people trying to say the next interstellar object that comes in, we'll try and land on it and see what it's made of and so on. But, there was a question up front and one in the back. So go ahead. Well, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't really a question, but it was, um, you know, when you were saying the universe is like 13 point something billion years old. Yeah. Actually, and then you're showing all the multiverses and stuff. Um, one other thing that you forgot to mention was we don't know what's beyond that. So we don't time, know yeah. if it keeps going as one or if it is multiverses. And if there are other beings out there, maybe they're so far away that they don't have the technology where we could intermeet. You know? Yeah, so, so well, we, the, the, we, our equations break down at T of zero. So we don't have negative time. Everything comes to a singularity. Uh, right, after right. that is not, we don't have physical equations for it. But, that 13.7 billion years, the universe may well be bigger than that, but we can only, we can't, so only that's called the observable that. universe yeah. where the light comes to us. As <clears> we, <throat> every year, light comes from another year, light year further away. Right, right. Yeah, so, so we see more and more as we go on. And so there may be things. There may be, we, yeah, so they are what's called uncausally correct, connected. And there may be other yeah. civilizations, but we just won't ever. There, yeah, yeah so that's right. So it's called non-causally connected, right? Because you can't communicate because you're, you're further away than light travel. And lifespans just don't reach. Yeah, them. right. There's one last, last question. Last question. Yeah. Do you foresee any uh, new basic science surprises? Uh, basics, well, I said in astronomy, I think there's gonna be the, the big new thing is gonna be JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, um, basic science, basic science is always coming up with new stuff. I would say, so I tell my kids, not that they listen to me, that uh, they should go into biotech. I think there's a whole lot of, you know, understanding the human genome and uh, doing healthcare through genetic research. I think it's going to be uh, all sorts of exciting, probably scary um, futures there. Um, but in astronomy, we are driven by technology. So if you can build me a better camera, we'll find a use for it. If you can build me a better radio, radio receiver, well, you can, you know, then that's great. Um, better material science. So actually, here's, we we are you know we had a, a faculty search and recently, and we were 
And there was a person who came in who has a new technology where, you know, when we, when I, when we capture light and we break light up and make a spectrum, you have to do that with a big instrument, a huge instrument, size of this room sometimes, for something that has to be for a big telescope, maybe not size of the room, but really, really big. And um, it's, it uh, flexes because of the heat is slightly hotter over here than there. And that means it distorts, things are not perfect. But these days you can put optics on a chip. You can break that light down on a chip. It's called a photo optic, photo photonics. Um, there's gonna be a lot of developments in the, in the next year. That's material science. And that will revolutionize astronomy, revolutionize communications. Um, so there's just a lot of great stuff going on. That's why, that's why it's great to be a tenured astronomer. Because so you can follow all this stuff. That will help basic science. It will help human. Um, it will help us in every way. Yeah. Uh, I would, yeah, I think that's the last question. Yep. Okay. Karen, go ahead and come on down. Peter.